So, this is a bit embarrassing. Upon withdrawal, Union of South Africa was purchased by John Cameron, a farmer from Scotland who would later go on to become the head of ScotRail. She made her Preservation Main Line debut in 1973, and ever since, besides overhauls and the occasional private railway jaunt, she's hardly been off the main line. In my defence though, back in February 2013, nobody could have predicted the news that would come four years later. For context, LNER A4 Pacific No. 6009 Union of South Africa, one of four preserved in the UK, was the subject of probably the biggest shock of railway preservation in 2017, when the locomotive's owner, former head of ScotRail John Cameron, announced his decision to place both No. 9 and the sole surviving Dresley K4, the Great Marquess, in a museum on a farm in Fife. And although planning application for said museum has fallen through twice so far, the current plans imply that both engines are never to work again. You could hardly have a conversation about either locomotive without people starting a fight, a petition, a campaign that was as useful as yelling at a cloud, or all three. People put in offers to buy both engines, but were declined. Hell, there were even calls for the A1 Steam Trust to get involved and purchase the locos from Cameron just so they had somewhere to keep on running after his passing. Me personally, I've been somewhat agnatic about the whole thing. On the one hand, we've got three other A4s in the UK, two of which have been in successional use on the main line, so it's not like we're going to go without. And at the end of the day, contrary to anyone who's going to go on and on about how Cameron's fueling his own ego when he did in fact preserve the locomotives for other people, whether we like it or not, he gets final say over his property. But on the other hand, I knew that when the day would come that both locomotives would never see a wheel turned in preservation again under their own power, it would no doubt be a sad day for many, almost on par with the dying days of steam in the late 60s. The Great Marquess was withdrawn in 2015 and has been on static display ever since. Meanwhile, Number 9's mainline certificate expired pre-Covid and spent whatever running days she's had left on the East Lancashire Railway. As of October the 5th, 2021, the locomotive was announced withdrawn from service with leaky tubes, and with less than five months to go on the engine's boiler certificate, there was no real justification in spending upwards of five figures over several weeks of repairs and testing, which wouldn't just stop at the tubes, only to realistically get a few more steaming days out of the engine before her boiler ticket was due to expire. The tragedy of number nine is that not everybody had the chance to enjoy her one last time before she left. It's like a friend or relative passing in the night. You know it's coming one day because who's going to live forever? But it's only when it happens that it hits you right in the feels. And when it happens by surprise, it only makes you realise just how little you really were prepared for it. With both expat A4s having not run since the 60s, Mallard at the NRM, Bittern on display in Margate, and Sir Nigel Gresley on the way back but still not quite returned to full service as of writing this, the world is briefly left in the unusual position of having no A4s in ticket for more than a generation. And that's kind of strange. I mean, I know you could effectively say any of this stuff about any class of engine, and most people would discard number 9 over something like Green Arrow, or the Adams Radial, or the sole surviving Flying Pig, because she'll need a ton of work on her next overhaul, but for those who appreciate the global impact Gresley's bathtubs had on the history of the steam locomotive, it's possible for more than just the diehard Gresley fans to make an exception here. Still, what life has number 9 had after 1966? Following restoration in the early 1970s, she's been generally proactive, regularly turning out on the mainline steam scene and bit-parting on the heritage railway circuit regularly enough to blend into the background of the preservation landscape. It's not like Bitter, which did a couple of years' work in the early 70s, posed as Silver Link in the late 80s and early 90s before spending far longer than intended being restored to working order in 2007, or like Mallard, which did two years' work between 1986 and 88 and then has done nothing. Number 9 has rarely had a chance to remain missed. As an interesting tangent, she was the talking point of political correctness in the early 1990s. When one of her mainline specials was publicised, the press latched onto the name Union of South Africa as something to oppress. For a bit of context, this was during the apartheid era of South Africa where racial segregation was part of their society, and to give you an idea of how frowned upon it was, the United Nations blacklisted any musical artist that played there during that period, including Queen at one point. But anyway, the locomotive was temporarily renamed to avoid any accusation that John Cameron supported the apartheid regime. What name did the engine carry? The one she was intended to have. When she was built in 1937, number 4488 was to have been named Osprey, keeping with the theme of naming other A4s after birds, including Kestrel, Kingfisher, Wild Swan, Gadwall, Falcon, Golden Eagle, and of course, Daffy. 
But with plenty going on to celebrate the British Empire that year, including the coronation of King George VI, five A4s were named in honour of the British Empire. The name Osprey was eventually carried by sister engine number 4494. So when number 9 carried this name in 1990, it was a weird occurrence of political correctness drawing attention to history without completely whitewashing it. Anyway, tangents aside, what I'd like to emphasise before wrapping this up is, if any of you have any problems with John Cameron doing what he's doing, it's okay to feel the way you are, but please, don't demonise the guy. I mean, I'm sort of in the crowd that doesn't agree that permanently retiring the loco isn't necessarily the best thing to do, but look, if you think you can change someone's mind with name-calling, hate campaigns, and generally complaining about their, let's be honest, harmless intentions, I mean, come on, the guy's not killing anybody over this, then enjoy the hand that feeds you, because it's a taste you're unlikely to find anywhere else. I stand by what I said in my roundup of the 2010s when I touched on this subject, albeit briefly. Things which seem permanent now are subject to change much later on. After all, who could have thought back in the early 1900s the common carrier's obligations that most railways wrote up in the 1830s would stifle the rail industry with the coming of road transport that could undercut the prices that rail had to cover? Lo and behold, an engine, two world wars, and a concrete-loving minister for transport later, the UK pretty much only sends freight by rail in bulk form nowadays. While it seems that later in this case may be more than 20 or 30 years' time, and even then the chances of that remain unlikely, there may still be a chance of the engine running again at least one day. Just maybe not in some of our lifetimes. But for those who are likely not to live to see her running again, we'll always have the memories of her. See you, number nine. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue. Smile.